It is a blessing to welcome you this morning to our online worship on this second Sunday in the season of Easter. Below you will find a worship bulletin and below a link also to where you may make an offering this Sunday. Our guest preacher this Sunday is the Reverend Martha Bennett, a newly ordained deacon in our diocese. And our guest musician is Peggy Howell, the organist and choir director at St. John's Lynchburg. Our worship begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. Have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read together Psalm 133. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessings, life forevermore. A reading from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here ends the reading.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it at my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, please take the fragile human words of this preacher and penetrate our existence for your glory. Separate wisdom from foolishness. Touch and transform us through the name and life of Christ. Amen. Good morning. Well, Easter Day has come and gone, and once again we are invited to reflect on the encounter between Thomas and Jesus in the upper room. It's a very familiar story, and Thomas can hardly outrun the reputation that this story has given him. He has been branded as a doubter. And if I'm quite honest with myself, in the past, I had sort of mentally relegated Thomas to a somewhat lesser status among the disciples because of this account. Yet Thomas's response to the other disciples who gave him the news of Jesus' resurrection is a very human one. Remember, they had already had the benefit of seeing Jesus on the night of his resurrection. And Thomas must have been suffering with overwhelming grief and and confusion at Jesus' crucifixion. But the story of Thomas' doubt is only a small part of a much bigger narrative. Wrapped inside the context of the appearance, words, and actions of Jesus in the upper room, we find doubt redeemed and turned into a blessing for the church, in fact, for the whole world throughout all ages. Jesus' greeting of the Easter shalom, his commissioning of the disciples through the breath of the Holy Spirit, and his blessing to those that have not seen but believe makes this short passage rich with meaning and quite astonishing in its legacy. A generation after the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke had been written, John prepared this narrative. Peter and Paul were already martyred. According to some, John wrote this Gospel after he had returned to Ephesus following his exile on Patmos. And this means the construction of the great temple in Ephesus dedicated to the emperor Domitian was underway. It was a full generation after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, and Rome was king. 
Heresies plagued the young Christian church and John's vital, vital purpose was to record his firsthand accounts of the ministry and life of Jesus, so critical to the continued life of the church. And so John brings us to the upper room. 11 of the disciples are gathered with doors locked and in great fear, grief, and confusion. The city outside is in complete and utter disruption. One might imagine that they have extinguished any light and speak only in whispers, wondering what is to come next. When suddenly Jesus, the object of their grief, the embodiment of their hopes and the future of Israel, stands among them and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you, shalom, are Jesus' first words to the gathered 11. Into the middle of this room, devoid of light and inhabited by people, suffering from such intense grief, loss, and yes, trauma, appears Jesus, and he utters one simple, ordinary word, a word so commonly used in everyday Jewish life, but in this time and place, it is spoken with a resurrected power that boldly addressed the atmosphere in that room and in the chaotic city and in the universe. Peace, shalom. Now when Jesus uttered his shalom, it wasn't just a pat on the hand kind of peace. This shalom takes on a new and ultimate meaning on this night, the night of the first Easter. And the meaning is that God's purpose has been fulfilled. This is an act of resistance against human injustice and, and empire, and a banner being raised that announces that God's kingdom has come on earth. This shalom is explained further by biblical scholar G. R. B. Lee Murray. This shalom is the epitome of the blessings of the kingdom of God, realized in the redemptive deeds of the incarnate Son of God lifted up for the salvation of the world. The shalom of the risen Christ on Easter evening is the it is finished of the cross. Therefore, shalom is the supremely Easter greeting. But Jesus is not done. He follows the peace with a commissioning, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Just as God breathed the breath of life into Adam in the garden, Jesus now breathes the breath of the Spirit onto the disciples. So the disciples have received the peace and all that it means, and through the Spirit they are empowered to carry on the mission. And it's into this context Jesus' return one week later becomes even more compelling. For Jesus comes back as the great shepherd looking for the one lost sheep. Jesus returns to offer Thomas what had already been given to the other 11. And although, although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them again. And he says for the third time, peace be with you, shalom. What happens next is not what we might expect. Jesus does not chide or condemn Thomas. He assures him. His words to Thomas are words of consolation. See my hands. Place your fingers in my side. Peace be unto you. And then standing face to face with the risen Christ, Thomas the doubter responds with what some scholars call the greatest Christological utterance and acknowledgement in the entire Gospels. Thomas utters the words, my Lord and my God. Yes, Jesus does not condemn Thomas. Jesus' response is not condemnation, but inclusion. For the kingdom of God includes those that have seen and those that have not. 
blessed are those who have never seen but believe, is for our own personal belief, but it's also a corporate blessing for the body of Christ through the ages and beloved communities of love around the world. I see something of myself in many of the people written about in our scriptures of the last several weeks. I hope to see myself in Mary, who was among the last at the cross, the first at the tomb, and the first to run and tell the disciples that the grave was empty. But I also see myself in Thomas, who said, unless I see. Where would you place yourself in this narrative? Well, this passage teaches us that God has not left us as orphans. God continues to chart a bold path, a vision for the world that we as the beloved community are invited to take an active part in. It's a family affair. We are invited and challenged to dream, to act and live, to bring to fruition societies of love and equity. Jesus' shalom of that first Easter morning is for us today in our own time of disruption. The divine breath of the Holy Spirit and the words of Jesus, so send I you, is for us today in our own world that needs justice so badly. And the assurance, blessed are those who have not seen but believe, is freely offered to us today. For God is making God's appeal to the world through you, through me, through us. Through the cross of Christ, life has a new reality. Let us all respond and welcome every day the risen Christ into our lives and be God's hands and feet in the world. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Risen Christ, open our hearts to your grace and truth. May we walk in newness of life. Teach us to love others in the power of the Spirit. May we walk in newness of life. Strengthen us as witnesses to your love. May we walk in newness of life. I invite your intercessions and thanksgivings at this time. Pray especially for parishes around our diocese and those commended to their parish prayer lists. Precious God, by water and the Holy Spirit, we have been buried with Christ and raised to new, the new life of grace. Give us inquiring and discerning hearts, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, 
and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Let us now pray in the words our Savior Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.